Hello and welcome back to Sitting In Jams. You're listening to episode 14. And I have a really important public service announcement to start off this episode. One. So I've done a little bit of research last week. All right? I got deep into the dark, dark sides of YouTube. I was trying to find out, you know, how, how can I spread more awareness of my podcast? And I watched a few videos here and there. And the general consensus was that we need more reviews. And I had a look on our Spotify and our iTunes thing. And I saw that we had a few reviews, which is really nice, but we need more. So if you're sitting, listening to the podcast right now and you have your phone handy, give it a wee swipe up, go on to Spotify, click on us and leave, well, please give us five stars. (laughs) You can give us four if you like, but five is what we're looking for. And it's a similar process on Apple Podcasts. So yeah, no shout outs for Bean Juice. I'm actually caffeinated this morning. Uh, I don't know about you two, but... I could do without the bean juice today. So we're looking for reviews. Please give us your, your reviews. <laughs> anyway, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Handyside, who is going to introduce today's topic. Yeah, let's get into it. So our topic today is talking about composition. Composition is a really fun topic to talk about because there are so many avenues. And I think the best way to really talk about it for all three of us, of course, we're all different musicians, is really just to ask, what was the last thing that you guys composed? Are you, is that just like open the dance floor? Take the stage. That's that's me opening the dance floor. Wow. Fine. Cool. Let's do it. Last piece I composed was called From Afar. And I wrote it when I was traveling to Bristol from Edinburgh. And yeah, I guess the piece was, it was written as an attempt to challenge my process for writing music, if that makes sense. It was more of an exercise initially. I wanted to write a piece where I wasn't at the instrument at all. I never even had an instrument handy. I just wanted to score it all out and try that process. My process before that had primarily been, I'd set the guitar and I'd find sounds and stuff that I wanted to move forward with in the composition. It was very much led by my fingers and my ears. But I thought it'd be fun to try and write something away from the instrument, hence from afar. And yeah, that's how the piece came to be. And I find that when I use that approach, I have used it quite a few times now. I think there are about three new tunes that I've wrote using that process. I find that I write completely different. You know, when I've got the guitar, there are shapes and things that I'm familiar with. And a lot is, I think, a little bit more physical. You know, I try to just try new shapes out and different sounds based on what my fingers can do. Whereas when I'm writing on the score, I I don't have to think about that. And I can actually think more about the other instruments. So yeah, I'll keep it brief, but the the last piece I wrote was called From Afar and the process was about um, writing away from the instrument. And I happened to be in a a new city that I'd never been in. And so that was somewhat inspiring as well. Callum, what about you? Nice, yeah, mine's might be a little bit different it's not a piece um as such but mine's was uh, like a solo basically written for um these jam of the month ideas that I sometimes do each month uh they're by a company called jtc um and yeah it's kind of similar to like true fire or any kind of online guitar course like they host a lot of online guitar courses um and I have a lot of fun just with like the different styles that they always kind of come up with and they've always got like a new guest um basically judging people's submissions for that month but I you know it's usually a kind of improvisational thing but I always take the time to listen to what I hear back to it it's like in response to what I'm listening to and I try and go down that rabbit hole of just looking for like a melody and then just kind of things to surround that melody so um, yeah I've been doing that quite a bit lately Um, apart from pieces like full-on pieces that are mine I've not really I've not really done too much of that it's always kind of like that improvisational thing of reacting to something that you're hearing. How do you find the limitation that the backing track puts on you? Does Do you find that that brings out more in your playing? Because I remember you posted a video of one of those, uh, I guess you could call it like a short composed solo, if you like. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know there's always elements of improvisation in that, but do you find that that brings out new ideas in you? Because obviously, I mean, they might be using some weird harmony that you're not used to or... And there's one piece, sorry, what I was trying to say is there's one piece that you put up where 
you played all these really cool half diminished runs. I'd never heard you play that kind of stuff before. I was like, oh wow, man, that's that's wicked. Yeah, it's so every single I think with each one that I do, you know, with the kind of pack that you download from the website, um, you get like a chord chart and you get someone kind of explaining like their um person like perspective basically on what they would do. And I usually never go for that. Um I usually always just go for um, I think with that specific one that you were mentioning, I think it was actually with one of Doro Guitars. Guitars. It was one of the, one of his instruments too, because um, I felt like I could I could go a bit more flashy on those guitars. Um, but yeah, I just like I, I I was only only following my ear, so I was trying out the kind of different modes that I hadn't actually used before because the sounds that I was trying, like they they weren't doing it for me. I wanted something like a little bit more spicy or just like something that just just maybe it wasn't the norm. So it's, it's, it's really pushing me out of my comfort zone each time and making me use new tools, like every time. Um, you know, even with the last one that I did, which was kind of like a retro wave kind of one, which is really cool, like electronic retro wave kind of back and track. Um, and that one, I was taking some licks that were maybe kind of inspired by like Jack Gardner or something like that. These kind of like, sweep-esque licks that he takes through um each degree of like the the scale so like starting on like degree one and then trying to do the arpeggio based off of that but he's got like a really cool and unique way of doing the um arpeggio pattern um so doing little things like that and just trying to make it my own too so never trying to do a carbon copy so always trying to take an element and then make it your own for again if it's like a small composition or something like that so i have a lot of fun with that and it always expands my tools that I can use over, over composing or improvisation. Jack? Oh, you're muted, man. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, I was trying to rack my brain as you were talking there, Callum. Um, the last thing I, I started composing, I suppose it's finished for the time being until I decide that it is not finished and I either A, rewrite the whole thing, um, or B, like, cut it straight down the middle and then just compose an entirely new section to it, which unfortunately does seem to be my process with composition, with composition surgery, basically. But the last thing I've been writing is uh, I've been studying some of the Coltrane changes stuff. I was, I was looking at 26 too, which is a tune that for some reason just always evaded me. I've just, I've never really just sat down to learn it. Um, so in the past little while I sat down to just get to know it, get to play it, um, try to understand how the chord changes move, that sort of thing. Um, and it kind of led me to be like, well, could I, re could I redesign these chord changes and kind of make them my, my own sort of thing? So I realized that with the Coltrane changes, because you're, you're, you're not tied to having to move to certain places, you're, you're working within the structure of the augmented triad, if you like, and the tonal centers that are there as well. So I don't know if you... If you're listening and you have a piano handy or a guitar handy, that's like moving from the key of C to the key of A flat to the key of E as well. But how you get there is very much up to you. So you could get there via dominant chords or, or, or whatever you want. Um, kind of constant structures as well would, would help you move there. So I thought, you know, I'll sit down and try to write my own sort of way about it. So I'd learned stuff like countdown, and giant steps and satellite and that sort of thing. But I think the thing that really drew me to 26.2 is the very strange movement that that seemed to happen um in the kind of second a sections if you know the tune you'll kind of you'll kind of know what i mean but yeah that, that was the first thing so it was a bit of a harmony exercise and then it became like well what do i actually like about the tune why is it memorable and why did i want to play it in the first place and i think it's like it comes down to the melody of the tune just straight up it's it's uh it's like a really sort of beboppy melodic tune over really difficult changes and it was one of the things i think I think it's really hard to learn how to compose a good melody. And I think it's hard to, to literally just sit down and decide to compose one in the first place. Um, you know, and so having the context of like, here are your chord changes, now go and thinking of, think of a melody is a bit of a backwards scenario, perhaps for me that I would compose in. So I spent quite a lot of time just listening to the chord changes. I'd recorded myself playing and just listening to the chord changes go by. Um, and I kind of finally came up with something that I like. And it's in that vein of 26.2 where it's like it's a it's quite an easy melody to remember, uh, but it functions in that same way as well. And I have to say, like working with the restriction of 
your core changes are already there. This is the thing that you're going for. Your form is already set. It really makes you sort of have to utilize all the tools that you that you have learned from learning other tunes as well. So it's been a really great exercise that way. But it's funny, like I I compose a lot of different things as well. Like Callum, I've been trying to explore more the idea of composing my own solos, that sort of thing. Um, not to any great, <laughs> not to any great um, success yet. But uh, yeah, no, it's, it's taught a lot working within restriction, I would say. And uh, I don't know, hopefully I'll release a little sound bite of it someday. Yeah, I've heard it. And uh, my first impression, I think Jack sent it to me on, oh man, what was it? It was like marimba or something, right? Yeah, so I would composed it at the instrument, but then when I put it into uh, Sibelius or MuseScore, I heard the MIDI instruments and I was like, these are terrible. <laughs> these sound so bad. So I reassigned the uh, the notes to, what was it? It was something like a glockenspiel and a marimba or like a right. synth and a marimba or something. That's what it was. softened the chords. Yeah, but yeah. It sounded like something out of Mario. Yeah, I, it reminded me of like Spyro the Dragon or something. Um, but it was cool. I would love to hear that piece played in like an acoustic setting, you know, like maybe guitar, bass and keys, and drums. That'd be pretty nice to hear. That's cool. One thing that kind of surprises me, actually, because I feel like we would have had this conversation before and maybe the answers would have been a little bit more like, oh, I wrote this song because this is how I was feeling. Or, But it seems that we've all actually, the last thing that we wrote was based on some form of limitation or like a, an exercise, which kind of, I think, reveals a lot about the process that we use for writing music. I think a lot of people have this idea that you just... It just came to me, you know? It's like sometimes it does, but most of the time it doesn't for me. Uh, and you have to kind of put in the work to make it happen. And placing limitation on yourself is a great way to bring out new sounds and ideas. And yeah, in Jack's instance, it's like, you know, maybe composing some sort of contrafact based on a set of changes. Callum has reacted to like a short backing track with, again, a set of changes. And I thought I would write a piece of music just away from the instrument you know all different processes but similar I think as that's well. important though you know like 100 percent. i think it's important to see that composition isn't always a process and in fact sometimes composition is entirely about the um the new process that you trailblaze as well i think that's really really important with it anyway and so i compose a lot of stuff for solo guitar i arrange stuff for you know all kinds of different um mediums as well and it really gets me thinking outside of the box. And I've realized that if I compose using the same methodology, the stuff that I end up coming up with sounds not the same, but it sounds like it's all part of the same sort of body of work in a way. And so I need variety. I also need to just be caught off guard um, when it comes to sitting down with a pen or whatever. But yeah, it's, it, I think method is a, it's such a funny um such a funny experience with, with with composition and i think it's really just about always trying to surprise yourself because that's kind of where the most interesting stuff comes from as well but yeah restriction is is one of those things yeah so um what i was going to ask a question just came up in my head there um with your composition process what do you feel you're naturally more drawn to first like what comes up first is it the melody like is that what gets priority is it the harmony is it maybe a rhythmic idea what do we feel is like our kind of, yeah, that, that's the main thing that we go to if we just go to, you know, put pen to paper. Jack, you got something? I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to answer it because there was a time when I started composing where a lot of my composition stemmed from the investigations into harmony and chords and that kind of thing. And it was great, but again, it's, it's like the process of sitting down to compose for a certain group of instruments or using a certain technology or whatever it is, that it can sound like your process can come through a little bit much in the composition, if that kind of makes sense. So you can start to hear exactly how you've composed these three different pieces. They may, they may even have like a significant amount of time apart, but they all sound like they're using the same type of methodology. And for me, that was a lot about I'm exploring harmony and how chords move and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so a lot of composition worked like that. I'm now trying to get to a place where I feel comfortable with all of those elements, whether it's harmony, rhythm, 
all those things. Um, melody as well. Trying to get to a place where I feel comfortable enough that I can start from anywhere, really. So most recently, I've started from trying to really think from the place of melody as well. Just trying to really appreciate what a good melody sounds like. Um, and that may sound like such a basic thing, but creating a good melody is all about the context of how does it interact with the chords? Is it memorable four bars on eight bars on, you know, when the song is done, is it, is it singable as well? Those are all things that I think you can, you can go back to old compositions and write completely different melodies and, and, and revamp the song. Um, but I, I do think at the end of the day, it, it goes to, it goes to say that I think it's important that we, we are able to start from different, from different elements to music I, that's just my my idea at least yeah i definitely agree with that as a student i guess um lifelong student of like music i think it's important to challenge yourself in many different ways but i do find that more often than not i actually write hmm i write harmony and melody at the same time a lot of pieces that i have written I kind of write as solo guitar pieces and then they grow into something else and what I'll do is I'll split the like maybe the harmonies getting played by the keys and the guitar plays the melody and then the bass is kind of doing its thing so I tend to write everything well so far as like just big blocks of harmony so it's quite normal for me to come up with an idea but already be thinking about chords as well as melody I'm trying to think about if there are any tunes I've written where I just thought about melody and nah, I feel like more often than not it's, it would be harmony before melody, but most of the time it's both things at once. I'm not entirely sure why that is, but I find that, you know, if I, if I find a chord or structure that I like, I'll straight away just go for like, oh, what would the melody note be? And then I'll sort of just play around with maybe the rhythm off that melody and feel my way around harmony after that. A lot of the songs I've written have used that process. What about you, Callum? Nice, yeah. Um, it's interesting that you say that. I definitely feel the the same in certain ways where it's like you're starting to kind of practice either being able to start with any, but also be able to include all of them at the same time if you're thinking about rhythm, melody, and harmony. Um, I feel like for me, sometimes I can just start with like the simplest melody. Uh, there's an exercise or Instagram video that you put a priest that I responded to, which was, I can't remember exactly what it was. You'll be able to describe it better, but it was um, the one where you're keeping one common note between everything that you're doing. And the, the whole composition is based on that one common note. Um, and I found that a great exercise because my mind went to places harmonically that I, I don't know what the names of these things would be called. I just went with it. I just like tried to create something. Um, and I found that it's probably one of these kind of limitations that just, yeah, just create something completely brand new because you, you're not really, you're not used to that. Maybe you're just, just used to having the biggest scope in the world for, you know, having all the different instruments at your disposal and having any key, any chords, or well, something like that. Yeah. It's just a lot of the time I'll just kind of follow my ear. Um, and really, I won't really use too much theory. For how much theory that maybe I've, you know, spent the time on learning, it doesn't come into play that much unless I get stuck. Um, it's always just this process that just happens and, you know, you listen to one thing and it, it takes you on to the next thing. That's that's basically it for me a lot of the time. It's just I'm always paving a story, I feel like. I feel like it's really kind of making a story from like a start to finish and trying to make something coherent. You raise a good point there about not using theory. And I think that's quite interesting because I have a lot of students who will be writing a song and they come to me the next week and they're like, I don't know where to go. Like, And I think music theory is a good way to explore the options of where you might want to go. But the way that I see it is that the practice you have done in theory has helped you build a vocabulary and a palette of sounds that you have available. And when you're doing that process of just seeing where it needs to go, you have all those sounds available to you, hopefully, and they come out naturally. So I, I'm the same as you. I don't really think theoretically unless I get stuck and I'm like, you know, how could I harmonize this? But more often than not, it's just, it really is just swimming about in the pool of opportunities and then sort of finding a little path and being like, yeah, let me try that. And 
more often than not, it's like I find a completely different direction for the piece when I take those kind of risks. Let me zero in on that as well, because, okay, so there's something that you said that when I really thought about it, I thought, I don't know if I really agree with it. And obviously, you know, we've all talked about music theory and the importance that at least we believe of the more that you know, the more that you can utilize. But I don't know about you, but I never really, if I get stuck with a composition, whether it's something I'm writing for solo guitar or for instruments, when I get stuck with a composition, I don't go to music theory to solve my answers. It's like um, a good example might be if you were writing a book and people know this because I love drawing references to literary work because I think there's such a parallel for, for composers. If you were writing a book and you know, you want it, you've planned for it to be 20 chapters long or whatever, and you're on chapter 17 and you're thinking, man, I have so many loose ends. I don't know how to tie them up. Is your process to go and, I don't know, read a dictionary or read, uh, you know, the theory of how sentences work or the theory of storylines or that sort of thing? Or is it to absorb something that has already done that? So a, a piece of literary work that really inspires you that perhaps takes it in a different direction. And I always think about drawing upon what, what has sort of proven to, to work. And to me, in my ears, the thing that's proven to work is music that I really like or that I just, I really resonate with. And so oftentimes, instead of going to the theory route, I won't go that way. I won't open a book. I won't get a notepad out or any, any of that kind of thing. Unless, of course, I am working within the restriction of the music theory that the composition sort of puts in front of me. But a lot of the time, I'm trying to kind of compose from this more sort of poetic way of where's the melody going to go on the chords. Mm -hmm. I want to hear stuff that, you know, music that's inspired me to even sit down to write in the first place. Why do I like it? It makes me think deeper about the stuff that I like. And so oftentimes I think it's about providing context to the piece of music that you're doing rather than to try to put more information into it as well. But I don't know that that's, that's me personally. I think, um, I think musicians in, in general are, uh, I say musicians, composers in this respect. I think composers in general are, are sort of afraid of the restriction what well, that restriction creates, if you like, or the, or, the, or, the, or the problems that restriction can create. And there's also, and this is going to sound really strange, there's also a security in having no restrictions because it means that you can do anything. You can modulate anywhere. You can add a new melody. You can get rid of a theme entirely. But, you know, it's, it's funny, like, I go back to it, something I heard from, from Peter Bernstein as well, which is like learning tunes is the thing. And he's talking about obviously improvising in the jazz world, but learning tunes is the thing that really teaches you about all aspects of your musicality, about always being able to grab the melody or always being able to reference the most important parts of the tune. And so when I'm composing, I'm always thinking to myself, is this still memorable as, as, a, as, a, as a melody or a motif? Is it still memorable? Because mm -hmm. if it's not, then perhaps it's not doing what it is that I intended of the music and, and that I appreciate from the other stuff that I hear as well. So I don't know that maybe that's a line of advice as well. Sometimes the answer actually isn't in music theory or more knowledge and it might be in trying to reference the things that you like and think about them from a different sort of level. I don't yeah. know. I, I wanted to zero in on that because I thought it was, I thought it was interesting. I think that's an absolutely good point And I agree with everything you said, but I also do think that music theory does have its place. There's, I remember there was a piece that you wrote called Picasso and I can't remember exactly what the structure was but you used a theoretical structure to work around a series of chords to, I think it was some sort of symmetrical thing that you'd done, I can't remember, and you used a theoretical concept to help evoke that composition. And another example would be, I'm trying to think of some sort of theoretical one but I can't for the time being. I could just make one up, but you know, say I was writing a piece and it, it was on, um, say I was on D flat major seven. I was like, I really want to modulate to B flat major seven. Now, obviously I could just go from one chord to another, but I could think, well, theoretically, what's a good way of voice leading that? Well, what if I go to the five of B flat and my chord progression goes D flat major seven, F seven to B flat. And suddenly I've used a theoretical theoretical concept of like well simply just using the five chord to pivot into the key that we're trying to get to and I do I do use little theoretical bridges like that quite a lot where I'm like well this is where I am I know I want to get to this part how can I build a bridge and I might like you did with Picasso I might create some sort of structure going up in major thirds or 
uh, simply just using the five chord of the key that I'm going to go to. Um, so yeah, I do use little, yeah, I think bridges is a good way of thinking about it. Like I build little bridges with theory to help me get to the points that I'm trying to get to. But most of it, like 80 or 90% of it is governed by my ears just, like that's what I want to do. That's where I feel like it needs to go. And you know, if I want to go from D flat to B flat, that's cool. I can just do that and it's fine. But if I want to voice lead in a different way, I could think, oh, what if I go to C minor to F to B flat, for example. And then there's a bunch of other things you could do based off of that change. But what are your thoughts on that, I, Callum? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, no, I, I was going to say like one of the reasons um, that I, I thought about that is I was taking apart a tune um, with a student recently called Autumn in New York, uh, some of you might know. And I think a really interesting exercise for anybody who's interested in this is go through and take out all of the chords that are passing chords. And what you start to realize is, I mean, the tune is 32 bars long, but it has a lot of chords in it, <laughs> as most ballads do. If you were to get rid of a lot of the passing chords, of course the passing chords work, but they are not integral to the tune necessarily. And what you sort of start to realize is that the tune is very much just basic movements to, I don't know, sort of two, five, one in the key of one, if you like in G, then two, five, one to C, that sort of thing. It's, it's very basic when you get rid of the passing chords. And what you start to realize, Vernon Duke is the composer of this tune, is that later on in the final A sections, he's decided to take the whole thing and modulate it up for, for eight bars. And then he's added a very interesting, complex, um, harmonically dense section where the tune sort of rounds itself off as well. And you can start to see in that way, analyzing it that way, how he's gone about composing it. And obviously he has used elements of music theory to sort of spice it up and do different things. But I think one of the really great things about that composition is that it shows you how he's tried to remain true to a single motif each time. And sure, there are elements of music theory that really um, augment the sound and they, they, they create a storyline within that piece. And it's a really beautiful piece of music as well. Uh, but it's interesting that when you, when you analyze a piece of music, and this is something that, composers should do it's like good writers good writers read good musicians listen you know um good composers as well they 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 listen and they they compose <laughs> but when we when we take apart tunes that way as well when we start to really understand what's going on you can actually start to see the intent of each composer and where they've made theory decisions or perhaps decisions on a whim so you can look at that next to a tune like lush life which again is a very complex difficult tune and see two completely different, you know, um, two two completely different methods. I would say uh, in composition as well. So, yeah, it's interesting to to have all those different angles. Absolutely, Callum. Were you going to say something there? Yeah, I was just going to just um, a little a little idea in my head there. When you were speaking last, Jack, one of the things that occurred to me is the things that we've been talking about in terms of like creating restrictions for you know, as his composers, feels the same as your frame analogy with the jigsaw. And that's just something that kind of occurred to me. I was just like, I remember when you were speaking about that in terms of like, you, you're getting your outlined section so that you can work inside of that. If you don't have that there, then, you know, you, you could go anywhere. Like the jigsaw could go like one mile that way. And you just, you know, having that kind of frame there keeps you kind of grounded in a sense keeps you on track i think um and it's sometimes sometimes something that i do is I actually pre-write the structure and logic so i'll just go like intro verse maybe like bridge chorus like that kind of thing and i'll, and I'll just put that there i'll just map something out um and that instantly gets me writing sections way quicker because i'm terrible for writing an idea saving the logic file and put it on putting it on my external drive I've got years of that <laughs> that I've not that I've not capitalized on. But I think just one of the other th little things that came to me there is like a little tip. Um, if you're stuck on your melody or you're stuck on your chords, is to see what your perspective of them is like the next day. Sleep on it. That's always a really good one too. Yeah, it's funny you mention setting out a structure. <laughs> I I don't do that at all, man. Like some of my charts, like I have like a sixteen bar verse and then like a. 14 bar bridge parks i've got like an extra two bars at the end and some weird time signatures <laughs> like i i compose quite often without that frame in fact most of the time without that frame 
I find it just, yeah, that's my preferred approach. Maybe I should try writing within more of a, well, setting out the structure first could be useful. But I don't know. I feel like I need to say the first statement before I feel like I know where it needs to go. You know, so setting out that structure, I don't know. I guess it'd be a good challenge to try. Be an interesting one for sure, if, it, if it's not something that you're used to. Yeah, I think it'd be good to talk a little bit about any processes that we do use that we've not discussed, because I know we've spoke about how, you know, we can maybe write a composition inspired by a set of changes or a place you are in, or the fact that you're not at the instrument. But I think there are a couple other approaches, and one that Callum mentioned there was recording yourself. And I think that it's so important to uh, distance yourself from it. But a practice that I use kind of with that approach is that I'll, I'll just improvise for, I mean, it could be like 15 minutes and then I just won't listen to it and I'll go back to it later. It could be a month down the line. I don't just listen out for any little ideas that I like. And there might be a tiny little nugget of like two bars in there that I'm like, Oh, that was an interesting movement. Let me pursue that. And I'll just go for it for a bit. Anybody else got any other little processes that you like to use? Um, process wise, it's a bit of a tough one. Cause yeah, I think a lot of the time, I think I mentioned this before, but sometimes the tone of what I'm using really has an impact on what I'm writing. Um, or what I feel like I want to write. Uh, you know, I love virtual instruments. I love, um, lush sounds, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I've got a really nice sounding piano or maybe a piano that sounds like it's been, you know, it's come straight from the 1930s and it's all broken up and it's like just all these different things just completely change the way that I want to play on an instrument. So, um, yeah, I think thinking about tone can sometimes have an impact on what you're going to write. Um, but for the most part, it's always, it's always just hearing what you have in your head. I think it's, it's trying as hard as possible to just keep going with that process because you'll start to spit out all the things that you actually like enjoy listening to like subconsciously. Um, I've heard quite a few people say that, that that's the way that they think about their influences. It's like they kind of gather all these influences. And if then, if you just listen to the ideas that are going to come out and you spend some time developing that, it will be this combination of those things. And that'll be like, you know, your thing, you'll start to have, you'll start to develop your own kind of idea or fingerprint as a composer. You are what you eat, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> what are you thinking, Jack? Document, 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 doc. just document everything. That's my process to even using stuff that doesn't work. Stuff that, you know, you, you explore for eight bars, 10 bars, and then realize mm, this isn't really going anywhere. I document everything all the time, whether it's on um, voice memos or it's just sitting down to play or put a video on or that kind of thing and something will happen. I'll go, great, let me, let me, let me see if I can you know, document this for another day or whatever. And I find that's really, really, really important just for me being able to go into like a bank of ideas as well. Sometimes you can start to trace that bank as, as well and go, oh, hang on a minute. I know why I, I had this idea. It's because I was listening to this or because I was doing this or studied this. But I think documenting is one of the biggest things you can do. It's a lot like, um, you know, people who keep a dream journal, for example, they say if you want to be more clear and, and, and sort of remember your dreams better, one thing they say is to keep a dream journal. Just try to get as much information down onto paper or to a notes app or whatever when you do dream. And I think that the truth is um, for composers, the goal is to try to be as clear as possible, both in intention and headspace when you compose. So one of the best ways to do it that I find is to just document anything that feels like an idea. And for a time I had, uh, I don't know where it is. I have like a lot of um, what they called, uh, you know, you know, these uh, yellow things that post you can write on post-it notes. There we go. Wow. My brain was lacking today. <laughs> um, post-it notes that for a time I had post-it notes everywhere. Like I looked, I looked like, a crazy person that was trying to solve an impossible puzzle but the point was like I'd, I'd put up challenges for myself which is like okay see if I can write eight bars every day or see if I can document a melody every week or that kind of thing and you know Callum like you there's a lot of it that sits on the hard drive or it sits in a bank of data and it just doesn't get used because I listen to it now and go 
yeah, I'm not really feeling the same thing. Or I listen to it back and I go, eh, these chords don't really, they don't really sit right because I have new ideas about that sort of thing. But you only really are able to have that, that post thought, if you like, that, that realization when you do enough documenting, I think. Um, because, you know, what you're documenting is not just things that you think might start a journey. You're documenting exactly what you like about music and what you want to try to represent in music that you'd be happy to put your name on as well. And that's a really important thing to do. So I would say you don't even just have to document, you know, notes, music, chords. You can document all kinds of things, feelings, um, sentences, that sort of thing. Uh, perhaps it's imagery as well. It was a big one for me for a time. Imagery, architecture that, that makes you realize a different point of view on something or even just kind of talking about an idea like I did for that piece Reese that you're talking about about Picasso it's a piece that I wrote and I introduced to a band a couple times it was ridiculously difficult <laughs> but the point was what I'd done is I'd taken the circle of fifths and with the circle of fifths I had drawn a point on kind of separate um, four points basically on the on the on the circle of fifths that would make a square so it's kind of going from like, uh, what would you have here? Like say F to uh, G, I believe, or D. And then, you know, you, you kind of triangulate it or not triangulate it, square it, I suppose. You square it and you end up getting, say, four closely related, but also very far apart tonal centers. And then that was the restriction that I worked around. My B section, instead of having a square, I used a triangle. So a lot like the Coltrane thing of, of having, say, C, A, flat, and E, I kind of use that as my, as my B section model as well. And I found that the thing that inspired me to do that was I was, I was, I was looking at some of the Cubist uh, exhibition stuff that was, that was on in London at the time um, from Picasso. And it really inspired me to think about, well, how could you mess with perspective and music that way as well? And because I was looking at a lot of harmony, that was the thing that really took me there as well. So yeah, my process really that, that seems to have rung true, regardless of the change of method or that sort of thing, or even the, the outcome of, of the music is just to document as much as possible. How important would you say an end result is in your compositional process? I know a lot of people stress about the amount of unfinished tunes that they have under their, under their bed. And I feel the same to some degree, but I feel like to me, it's quite important to try and see a tune out to the end because then I can really see it for what it's worth. But I know a lot of people just have little snippets and little sections. And yeah, I mean, both of you, how important is it to try and see a compositional idea out to the end? See it as a piece. Yeah, I think that's something that I desperately need to do loads this year. I need to do that so much because if you're... If you if you become you know that person that's only writing these little riffs or little ideas or something like that, that's that's all you'll ever write, and you you've not got good at the entire process. You've not got good at finishing a song. That's really important. So, um, for me personally, I'll need to go back, revisit some old ideas, and just try and get a finished thing. Because again, it's not about the finished thing. It's about that experience of going through the entire process and being able to do that like hundreds, thousands of times across. A very long period of time, you know. If you if you really want to get good at that thing, that's that's really what it's going to take. Like all the best composers, you know, how many pieces have they written that no one's probably even checked out? Because they don't get, they might not get known for those ones. But the ones that people do know them for probably wouldn't have happened if they didn't write all the other stuff. You know, what I mean, it's just one of these kind of duality esque things where um, all that other stuff needs to happen. Just yeah, trial and error, do it loads. And finish songs that's definitely what i need to preach and do this year is finish songs i sit somewhere in the middle personally i think that thing that you're talking about callum i think it's, it's it's really good to be able to do you're talking about the discipline of being able to finish something which is a skill i believe entirely on its own i also though think that there are pieces of music that you know okay let's let's wipe this slate clean just very briefly I think the very interesting thing with music is that the experience of music that most of us have is that it has to last beyond a minute to be valued for one. Um, it has to have some big sort of 
um, arc, perhaps a story arc or a melody that changes or, or development, that kind of thing has to be some, some interesting harmonic or rhythmic movement. And I think sometimes it makes us undervalue the fact that an idea can simply exist for eight bars. And I think a lot of the time we go, well, if it's eight bars long or if it's four bars long, is it really music? Is it really, is it really anything? Is it developed enough? And I think it's because we all come from this understanding of music has to be a 32 bar tune with an AABA section or music has to be um, in sonata form or it has to be uh, an endless 10 minute groove, basically, with the changing melody. We all have entrenched ideas about what music is because of the stuff that we listen to, because of how culture takes on music as well. And I think the interesting thing is when you go to hear music from a different culture, you realize that music is often not it's not composed in the same um it's not composed for the same sort of reception as, as we might think it is whether it's like sit down and and receive it that way or, or, or whatever so i've started to realize that some of some of the ideas that i have sometimes all that really that they want to do is is last for eight to ten bars and that's all that they really are in that time and it's not for lack of like i know that i could push it and create something out of it but there's stuff that I've composed even that's that's 12 bars long. And I think, do you know what? There's a value in this only being 12 bars. It makes me appreciate this really, really short piece of music that doesn't necessarily need an ending or development. Nice. Yeah, that's that's made me think of something. I was listening to um, some short pieces of music last night just on the way home. Um, I was feeling a bit nostalgic. So I just I went back to like... First time I'd really started like playing games, which was the SNES, the Super Nintendo. And you realize that when you go through like these playlists of these tunes, some of the YouTube videos are eight seconds because all the music is being composed. They have all, all the music is like, it's, it's got very specific roles um, in terms of like, like the intro scene um, and then like the, the menu screen and things like that. Like all these things have a very, very short repetitive bits of music that can just loop basically so uh that just made me think of that so it's like you can you can have a finished piece that's eight bars you can have a, have a finished piece that's eight seconds because it might serve that role so that's just a, another little addition that's that's a good point yeah i mean i think jack you'd said something about music lasting longer in a minute as well and i've heard some beautiful little etudes that they fulfill me in their last in a minute or they're particularly short I think it depends on what the piece is being used for. And I think that, at least for Jack and I, we play music that is often improvised and it's quite easy for us to get a 10 minute performance out of a four bar <laughs> uh, riff, for example. It could easily extend further than that. And yeah, I think it's important to think about the context of which your music might be getting put into. I changed my process when I started to play with a quartet. Before I was writing just with anything in mind. I was writing string sections and like horns and um, yeah, that isn't usually the context I find myself playing in, at least my music. Now it is possible, but it just didn't come to be. And so, yeah, I think it's important to think about what, at a certain point with the composition, it's like, what, who do you want to play it? Or what kind of ensemble do you want to play? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Does anybody yeah. consider that when they're writing? You're like, what kind of ensemble is going to be playing the music? I think it depends what the intention of the music is, though, as well, because mm. if... I mean, here's the thing as well, and this is something that I think it can really ruin a lot of artists, a lot of good artists as well, because they can midway through their compositional journey change their mind about what their composition is about because they start going well i'm composing it for this specific player or this person or mm, if somebody picked this up then i wonder what this would sound like and then you start really getting in the heads of other people and how they'll they'll receive it and i think ultimately that can really damage your your intent with how you started and i think the thing that's not discussed a lot of the time is that your perspective of the piece of music that you start with say you start with four bars and you want to see where it goes it can change a lot you can have brand new ideas you can have moments where you hate it you love it you want to change it you want to rip it up and throw it away you want to put it in the you know the local national gallery and have everybody see it and whatever but really i think it, it, yeah it's a funny process i 
I sort of think that musicians should be okay with composing things that don't necessarily have a, a purpose or a role or an ensemble, stuff that even can exist just for you as well, which is cool. And I'm sure that we've all done that. There's pieces I have that, not that I don't feel ready to release it or, I don't know, to post it or to, to share it. It's more that the purpose doesn't feel right for me to, to post or share it. It's just, it's not that kind of piece of music. And knowing that that doesn't mean it's unfinished or that it's, you know, it could be better or it needs another section. It's that actually it's done the job that I needed it to do in that, in that respect. Nice one. All right. I think we could probably keep talking about composition for another couple hours. It'd be quite easy for us to just keep jamming these things. But I think a good place to wrap it would be to do a quick fire round of our top tips for composition. Now, Jack and I done this a little bit differently in the last episode where I would say something, then he would say something, we'd kind of bounce that around. So let's go in the order of, say, Reese Callum, Jack, all right? And we'll, we'll go around and we'll each give uh, at least two top tips for composition. Does that sound like a plan? Cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, my first tip is to practice stream of consciousness writing. So sit down in whatever way you're going to write. It might be the guitar, piano, saxophone, or a score, and just write. You know, set yourself a timer for 30 minutes to an hour and just write ideas after ideas and try not to judge them too much. Just let it all come out. A lot it might be, uh, I don't know, it might not be your best work, but that's fine. I think you got to turn on the tap and sort of wait for the water to come out clean at a certain point. And that process of just writing stream of consciousness, I think is really good for that. Callum. That's that's difficult. I feel like I would I would I wouldn't say that I, I would say what you've said, but not an in as good a way. Um so yeah, I'm I'm now struggling to think <laughs> to think of one. You can pass it on if you like. Let's just keep let's, like let's go Jack. Let's go Jack. Okay, I would say just to reiterate my point before, which is just document everything that you can. Voice memos, clapping rhythms, little riffs, chords whatever it is, even like the birds in your garden, if it's something that really makes you want to compose, document everything that, that you feel might become something or perhaps, you know, might just kind of fulfill a very basic idea. Try to do that as much as possible. Nice. All right, I'm going to jump in. Callum, if you have one in a minute, feel free. If you feel like you've gotten stuck with your composition in any way, like, you know, the, oh, I don't know where to go next, Simply just think about where you've been and let that inspire what needs to come next. I was working with a student the other day who he'd written a really nice intro verse and chorus to a song that he was playing. And he's like, I don't know what should happen in the second verse. And I was like, well, what's the first verse about? And he was like, well, it's about this. And I was like, well, where's the story need to go? And he's like, well, this is what should happen. I'm like, great, <laughs> go and write it. And it was a really simple exercise. It's like, well, just think about where you've been. And that, if you you know, sketch it out. It's like, well, maybe I use these chords. Could I use them again? But I'll change this maybe, or maybe the song is talking about this person. What if, what if I change the perspective in the second verse? So zoom out, think about where you've been, and that should in some way encourage a new idea for where you could go. Nice. Well, you've perfectly said, Reese. actually, the demonstration of what you've just said fits perfectly with my next one, which is if you're really stuck on an idea, sometimes what I do is I get a friend to listen to it and get their perspective. And it sometimes gives me a new um, a new road to go down for a little bit. Sometimes that just sparks an idea. Just like, yeah, um, having someone else's perspective is super, super useful and can be um, almost the kind of function as uh, a friend sent me this app that basically just kind of gives you like a random statement, a random idea. Um, for if you're if you're kind of stuck at like a junction for something that you're doing and sometimes just that tiny little like phrase or anything like that can just spark a new idea so i think that kind of like has the uh, same role i'll try and get the name of the app too i can't remember what it's called but um yeah just something like that that can really take you out of your perspective and spark a new idea uh okay so my tip is gonna sound a bit strange but a really good tip to be able to do if you're an improviser or a composer which is take your favorite piece of music right now whatever it may be and what you're going to do is you're going to sit with your headphones on and you're going to listen to every single instrument first you're going to listen to the whole thing 
you're going to listen on your first listen you're going to listen to the whole thing what does all of the music sound like what is all of the melody the all of the form that sort of thing now what you're going to do is you're going to stop it and then you're going to go way back to the start and then you're only going to listen to say the guitar or the piano or the voice or the drums you're only going to listen to that one thing you're going to hyper focus on that one instrument and you're going to keep doing that until that you have listened individually to all of the instruments in your favorite piece of music and what you will then have is an individual perspective for the role of those those instruments what exactly you like about the piece as well there'll be things that you go wow, i didn't realize that the the double bass played played an anticipation on like at the first the first i don't know bar of every four bars or something that's really effective it sounds really good it pushes the blah 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 blah, blah whatever that will give you so many new ideas and so many new perspectives to see composition from as well. So that if you ever get stuck with how do I write for drums or how do I write for bass or how do I write for piano, go and listen to these things in context and it will give you a, a new way to kind of hear things as well. But yeah, I suppose we are, we are trailing on to the very end of our, of our episode today. It's been really fun to talk about composition and, and Reese, as you said, I'm sure that we could bring this up at another time as well because there are, there are so many ideas and so many pathways that we could we could go down to to continue this conversation. Um, but yeah, I just want to thank you, the listener who is sitting at home, perhaps you, the budding composer as well. We hope that these ideas inspire you and make you want to take your pen or your instrument or your piano or whatever it is um, out to try and work on things. But, you know, we would love to like we'd love to hear from you as well in the bottom of our comment sections on social media. So whether that's YouTube or Instagram or, or any of that kind of thing, how do you get started comp? Composing, or how do you get over roadblocks when you're composing as well? Let us know in the comment section. We would love to hear from you as well. Um, and I'm sure it will spur on to new topics. But for now, this has been sitting in episode uh, I'm 14. 14. There we go. Wow. And we will see you in the next one. <laughs>